Welcome back, everyone. Um, in today's lecture, or in this, this video's lecture, we're going to be looking at Chapter 7, uh, Middle Childhood, Body and Mind. Um, so if you want to follow along the book, it's on two, page 233. As always, you can follow the PowerPoints if you pull them off on D2L, same place you found um, this video. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Don't forget to listen for the four random facts as we go um, for, the, for the quiz to get the credit for watching the lecture. All right. Um, so yeah, on that note, let's, let's go ahead and get rolling. Um, and we'll, we'll see where we get to end up with. So middle childhood, <clears throat> we, we, the previously we looked at age two to six, the early childhood. Um, at this point, we're, we're beginning to come into our own. Um, you're, you're going to really be able to see kind of the, how the individual, what makes them tick basically at this point. Uh, and this is a stage where they are going to be really developing themselves and, and further discovery of who they are, what they're good at, what they want to do, all those factors. Okay, so let's jump in. Um, slide two, middle childhood. So middle childhood, period between early childhood and early adolescence, approximately from age six to 11. Especially on the far end, the, the, the 11 portion, it really does vary. Um, some kids will, will be through this stage by nine or 10. That's the earliest I've ever seen. Um, other kids, it might, they might still be in this area of development, 13, even 14 years old. Um, but 11 or 12 is going to be kind of the, the go-to for most individuals. Okay. Um, it's safeguarded by genetic and environmental factors. This is actually one of the, the, if you've made it through the first five years of life, uh, this is going to be one of the safest stages. Um, overall. Evolutionary perspective is that the genes protect children who have already survived the hazards of birth and early childhood. And so this is what keeps us, um, this is the least likely period of life for death to occur from anything. Okay, whether that be disease, whether that be genetic issues, whether that be uh, accidents, all of those things are, are less likely here. So let's go to slide three. Um, a healthy time, part one. Low th uh, lower death rates today than any other point in history. Uh, partially due to immunizations, there's less lethal accidents and failed illnesses because of immunizations, good medicine, good health practices. Um, the accidents, lack of accidents is actually due to, it, it used to be one of the primary things was death by uh, accidents with animals. So if you go back 100 plus years, you know, like horse, uh, you kick by a horse or fall off a horse, things like that. This was an age that that kind of thing would occur. Um, then you had like kids working in factories, which, you know, lots of accidents potential there. Um, but yeah, for the, for the most part, age five to nine, according to like it shows in the graph here, um, is the least, the least chance of death occurring. Okay. Um, you can also find the graph that I'm looking at right now. If you're following in the book, it's on page 234. Okay. So there's fewer chronic conditions. Uh, we have better diagnostic and preventative medical care, right? Something starts to happen. We can take care of it more easily. Um, we have more tools in our toolbox basically to help with that. There's less secondhand smoke. Um, there is still pollution, unfortunately, especially for like kids that are growing up in the cities and things like that. Um, but not having a direct source of pollution right in your own environment is definitely an advantage. Um, better health habits overall, brushing your teeth and things like that are going to be more common today than they were in the past. Um, specialized programs <clears throat> that basically can help out with with uh, with everything, right? From from issues that you might have again, improved oral health. Um, is going to be another factor there. So, you know, yeah. that's the norm today. We we do see a little bit of an interesting shift. I'll talk about this in a little bit, but there's a shift in um, allergies and things like that. But uh, overall, we tend to be healthier. There's also a big shift in uh, one of the issues that we are, are starting to deal with in the last 15, 20 years is um, struggles with weight and lack of movement. Um, and there's, there's been a rise in that in the last 20 years. Basically, as video games have become more impressive than what I grew up with, um, there's a tendency for kids to spend more and more time inside. So, all right, we'll talk about that in, in more in depth in just a second. Slide four, healthy time, part two, growth and healthy habits. So average child gains about two inches and five pounds per year at this point. So our rate of growth has slowed even more compared to what it was in early childhood. Um, but we... That's going to be the norm, right? And then when adolescence occurs, we'll end up having a spike of growth, typically both in weight and in height. Um, but the average in this period will be about two, two inches a year, give or take. 
Uh, maintenance of good health related to adult instruction and regular medical care, right? Uh, this is a learning stage still. And so this is where a lot of times your habits of like what kinds of foods you're choosing to eat, um, are you an exerciser or a couch potato and all those kinds of things uh, will, be, will be formed in this stage of life. Um, it doesn't mean that you won't slack off, right? Like you might, you might have a perfect, you know, you're outside running every day and all these sort of things. Um, and then when you get into like adolescence, you kind of find yourself slowing down and in early adulthood, you'll find yourself slowing down even more. Um, but if you do exercise and eat healthy in this stage, you're more likely to continue doing so later in life and, or to pick it back up later in life and, and succeed with it. Um, there are camps for children with special health needs, uh, today that, that can be very beneficial. Um, to basically increase the likelihood of movement um, and teach them and teach them skills that that uh, opens up more doors to them to in order in order to basically engage in uh, active play. Okay. All right. Slide five. We're just rolling right along. Hopefully this might get through it really quickly. Um, healthy time part three. Physical activity. Okay. Again, the broken record begins right. There are the four main things, and you, this is going to be the true all the way through. Um, movement, you need to exercise, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be like specific, like I'm getting on an exercise bike or I am lifting weights, but you need to be actively moving uh, every day intentionally, right? It, it could be with kids, it could be running around, climbing trees, you know, climbing whatever, um, running around, rolling under things, crawling, and all that kind of stuff. That all is those kinds of physical activities that you're looking for at this stage. Uh, playing sports, right? Sports start to become a thing in this stage. Um, where you're looking for team activities and things like that, which could be very beneficial. Uh, but so physical activity, good diet, which we'll look at here in a minute. Um, getting enough sleep again and breathing well, making sure that you're breathing through the nose deeply, getting enough oxygen into your system. Um, if you do those four things, your, your, the overall benefits will be, um, substantial. Like there's a, there's a measured difference between, if you just do any, even one of those things, there's a measured difference. You do all four of them combined and you have an amazing uh, possibility of benefiting the individual's development. Okay. So movement actually in, uh, advances in physical, emotional, and mental health. They found that people who are more active, especially in this stage of life, um, this middle childhood stage, are, they're, they're, they're basically, their brain develops much quicker than kids who are more sedentary. Okay. So if you're a couch potato, get up and move, right? Um, academic achievement improves. Um, this is, there, so there actually is a direct correlation slash causation, which you're gonna find is oftentimes the smartest kids in a school or in a, in a given class. Um, they're typically not just like super nerds necessarily. They might be nerdy, but they're not gonna just be like straight up, you know, uncoordinated nerdy kids. Typically, the, the top kids in the class will also be relatively ac athletic. They might not be the best athlete, Okay, but they're engaged in physical movement and activity. I'm roll my sleeves up, sorry. I don't know why I wear long sleeve shirts. I, I, I always end up rolling the sleeves up. But anyway, um, they're, they're engaged in physical activity in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so if you want to be the best chess player, for example, you don't just play chess. That's an important part, but you should also be doing physical activities along with that. Okay, get out and move. Even if it's something like, it, I mean, it doesn't have to be like high impact necessarily. Um, you know, if you have a kiddo that just doesn't want to move for some reason or other, like they're just not, that's not their thing. Um, you get them into swimming, get them into like, I don't know, Taekwondo or something. Um, judo, judo and jujitsu are exhausting and it's a good workout. Um, I recommend that for adults also, but um Get them, get them, find something that they like to do. Teach them to juggle, right? Get them into something, ride a bike, um, pogo stick, jump rope, something, right? There are things you can do. But what that does basically is actually improves the, the circulation within your system. So you, you, you're, it causes you to breathe more deeply. Your heart starts pumping and blood starts flowing. And you actually have an increased amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide available to the brain. Those things actually, we need both. We, we, uh, a lot of times we are, we're always looking at like the fact that we're breathing out carbon dioxide because it's waste, uh, a waste product of our cells basically as we, as we are creating more energy in our bodies. But we actually need a certain amount of carbon dioxide in our system for our cells to function properly. Um, so we're looking for that balance. Good exercise that gets you up and moving, gets you working, um, basically causes that to happen. Okay. So academic achievement will improve with 
more exercise, which is also why it's, it's kind of concerning when we look at the, the loss of things like PE or the reduction of PE and recesses and the like um, in schools. That can be an issue for if, we, if we're actually looking for greater, greater intelligence, um, those things should be encouraged along with it. Okay, so concerns. Uh, why would people maybe say they don't want their kids to do these things? Harm from sports is one possibility. Um, and this is a legitimate uh, concern, right? The more active you are, the more likely you are to hurt yourself. Um, but nice thing is, is if you're a kid, if you do get hurt, you are more likely to bounce back from that injury, right? We are we are basically, we're, we're kind of made of rubber, but not exactly, right? But our, our bones and everything will heal much more easily um, with, with very little long-term negative effects. Uh, brain injury and other impact-related injuries are, are a little bit more legit. Um, honestly, even when I see a kid like bouncing a soccer ball on their head or something like that, it makes me cringe a little bit because I know every every one of those little micro impacts is is basically a micro concussion. Every time you smack your head, you're, you're damaging your brain to some extent. Um, if you're playing an impact sport like hockey or lacrosse or you know American football, rugby, um, to some extent even soccer. Uh, in fact, there's actually more injuries, more head injuries in soccer than any other sport with kids. Um, per capita kind of a thing. But the, the, if you're, if there's a high chance of, of smacking your head, um, you may want to look at other pathways, uh, at least in this age group. Okay. Later on, when you're, when your, your brain is more developed, it has less significant impact negatively, uh, on, on your brain development. It still causes damage, right? You smacking your head is not a good thing. There's a reason why NFL linemen, that every every time they go, they they smack their head typically, and with that, they they found that they have um, significant brain loss early on in life. Usually by their late forties or late or early fifties, they're already showing um, a significant decline in in their in their uh, brain's workings. But uh, so yeah, something you might avoid. But that doesn't mean they can't play sports, right? Tennis, racquetball. Um, basketball to some extent there's still a chance of getting smacked in the head or something like that but that's still a decent one baseball there's a deep good chance you're not going to get hit in the head uh, unless the pitcher is terrible um softball right all those kinds of sports racket or t-ball um yeah look for sports that get them out get them moving but don't necessarily increase chances of head injury uh are there a chance of injury sure that's part of being alive right um if you somehow make it through life without getting injured, you've probably had a pretty boring life. So that's kind of approach it that way. Okay, slide six, a healthy time, part four, need for movement. So indoor activities often replace outdoor play. Um, I think we talked about this last week or last in the last classes or, or modules or chapters, whatever it is. Um, but that there's been a significant shift in, in the amount of time spent outside. Um, and it's basically, so, so 50 years ago, 1970s, um, average time spent outside was a little over three hours per kid. Today, that time has basically been replaced by screen time. Um, some kids, depending on the areas in the, in the country, um, the average time may not even, they might not spend time outside. The, the amount of time might be just walking from the building that they live in to a car or something like that. Um, and so that, again, that can be kind of concerning, right? Um, as, as things have changed. Interestingly, also, there has been a, a you know, there's, we have this tendency as parents to want to protect our kids more seemingly today compared to the past, which is why part of the reason why there has been this movement towards indoor play and video games and things like that. Um, but again, statistically, uh, there's actually less child uh, physical harm and or like like accidents and things like that today compared to even like 20 years ago. Um, and it's like it's not necessarily because we've actually pulled our kids inside. It's just, there, there's less chances of it today. Um, does that mean you should let your kiddos run around, you know, totally unsupervised? Probably not. Right. Depending on their age. Um, but the older they get, let give them more freedom. Okay. What are some things that might keep us from playing outside? Economic barriers and disabilities may limit participation in league club and other after, uh, after school activities, right? If you have a, uh, a disability, a physical disability in some way, shape or form that can hinder, uh, getting involved in, in in like team sports and things like that. Um, economic barriers is a big one potentially also. If you're in a lower economic bracket, and let's say you want to play like I don't know, football or, or lacrosse or something like that, right? Something that has a lot of gear involved with it. Um, 
maybe the answer would be to go like baseball or something. But anyway, but the, if you have a lot, something with a lot of gear, uh, it can be very expensive to get involved in those sports. Uh, and or if you have like, if you want to get in something like, let's say like Taekwondo or, or karate or judo or jujitsu, you have to buy the suit, which can be kind of expensive, right? The, the, the gi. But uh, you also generally have to pay a monthly fee. And that monthly fee can can be something that keeps you out of it. Same with like like gymnastics or dance classes or things like that. Other other activities that might get you involved um, in movement, but the fact that there's a monthly fee that that can put a strain on a family who is in the lower economic brackets. Um, when ac academic instruction replaces physical education, less physical activity may cause less learning. Like I said, there's a little bit of a worry to me at least. Um, and to a lot of people who are doing research on this with when there's this movement away from PE classes or even not, it's not required anymore. Like you, you can easily just get a pass on it because they're like, well, I just don't like it. Um, what they find, what they're finding is basically it, it's, it's reducing the development of the individual's brain. Um, if, if we wanted to actually like diversify PE, right? Like we're like, maybe the kid we're wanting to offer something besides just running or things like that because of we're wanting to help kids that have disabilities or things like that. Um, maybe make it more diverse, offer activities that, that are, uh, you know, capable of, of multiple, uh, body types, body styles, and all those kinds of things. Okay. Um, and also being okay to not be the best at something is okay. Right. Uh, just because I'm not good at running doesn't mean that I can't run. I might look weird. Uh, and the fact is that if you don't run often, you're going to look weird, right? Like you're, you're, it takes a coordination. I have a friend who's a PE teacher, and that's one thing he talked about. Um, he's been, he's taught PE for over 20 years now. And he said 20 years ago, you know, nine out of 10 kids could run well, and, and you have that one awkward kid that has it, that struggles with running. Um, and typically, when you talk to him, you'd realize that they they'd spend a lot of time indoors. Today, it, it's pretty much the flip flop. He said, "You're lucky if you have a class of like 30 kids. You're lucky to have three to five that actually run well. Um, pretty much the rest of the rest of that group is, is going to be like awkward and struggling. And he specifically works with kids that are in first grade to fifth grade. Um, that, that's his, his main focus. Uh, he's like, he's, kids don't move enough. And so because of that, they don't get the experience uh, that they need to learn how to move their body through their environment. So get up and move, right? Make that part of a, make, make that an everyday thing. Find something that the kid likes and get them up and moving. Okay. Just that PowerPoint's thinking. Slide seven, a healthy time, part five, brain development. Um, so with physical activity, cerebral blood flow and neurotransmitters and better moods, basically they're all part of this. They've actually done uh, several studies on depression and anxiety, and they've tried to figure out different ways that, that can, that can help relieve them um, in every age group. And they actually found that even more than using like substances like drugs and things to help with uh, reducing the symptoms of depression, um, and even more than meditation. Meditation actually is about as good or a little bit not quite as good as medications for people who, who suffer from chronic depression and anxiety. Um, they, th they found the one thing that actually outperforms all of them is exercise. It, it, in, because of the increased cerebral blood flow, um, and the increased neurotransmitter activity, basically, uh, it, it improves the overall mood, reduces the effects of depression and anxiety. Um, so yeah, that coupled with changing diet can be a, can be a massive help. Um, now, does that mean that it's going to like, that's the answer for everyone? No, right. There are some people who there, there is just, there's a neurotransmitter imbalance or something like that. Um, that's just biologically there. And so they have a tendency towards it. But if, even if you're taking you know, medications to help with it um, at any age, also include exercise in that. And that'll, for one thing, it'll improve the effects of that medication um, and or even reduce the amount of medication that you need. Okay. Um, so yeah, move around. Embedded cognition, a connection between body movement and thinking. Most people, so we always hear like, you know, I'm an auditory learner or I'm a visual learner and blah, blah, blah. Okay. Uh, most people actually are, are to some extent kinesthetic learners, meaning that our brains and our bodies, because we are, I mean, we, again, we're, we're, we're working with ice age hardware in a modern day world. Okay. Um, our brains and bodies are, are made to sync up together and to be one unit, right? Get us through, get us through the environment. When I'm learning things, I would 
traditionally, I would be also doing the thing that I'm trying to learn. I'm hearing the story maybe, but I'm acting it out and things like that, right? They have found that there is a direct connection. If, if, if a child can move while they are learning, they will take that information in and retain more of it for longer. Uh, and it basically becomes a deeper part of who they are. Same thing for adults. So you as a college student in this class, um, keep that in mind. You know, maybe while you're while you're doing your, your reading or things, take take a short walk. You know, walk around your kitchen table if you got a kitchen table. Um, do something where you're you're actively moving while at the same time learning the new material, and it'll stick with you better and for a longer period. It'll become more of who you are, part of your understanding of the world. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Slide eight. A healthy time, part six. Health problems. Childhood obesity is, is a big one. Um, it, it can affect paying attention. So neurological advances allow children to pay special notice to most important environmental elements. Actually, I take that back. The obesity thing, we're going to hold off on that in a second. I'm not sure why it's on that slide. Sorry. Um, so brain is the brain is developing, right? The, the prefrontal cortex is coming more online. Still not fully there. We still got over a decade before it's fully developed. Um, but it's coming closer. Okay, it's, it's becoming more integrated with the rest of the brain. Remember, the, 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 the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that makes those long-term decisions. It's, it, it, it takes a look at what the possible outcomes are and makes a plan given that information. Uh, so executive control and selective attention. That's our ability basically to control where we are going with things. And selective attention means I can sit down and focus on something intentionally. Okay. I'm no, I am less easily distracted than I was before. And my willpower begins to form where I can I can put off my pleasure in the moment for a greater good in the long run. Okay. Um, reaction time is going to improve with physical play maturation. Again, the, the more you move, the more you wiggle and, and run and climb and all that kind of stuff, um, your overall reaction time will improve in your thinking as well as your physical uh, reactions. So uh, if you're... If I'm wanting to, if I if I give you like a, a logical problem, right, um, you are you are more likely to get to the answer more quickly if you have been an active person. Your IQ, which is basically measuring some of those aspects, will improve with physical activity. Okay, as well as the physical maturation of the brain, um, you're basically giving it an extra boost to help it keep moving along. All right, first random fact before we move into the next slide. Um, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the, the Louvre in 1911. Um, interestingly enough, after it was stolen, more people went to visit the Louvre in, that, in the frame or the, 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 the months and years afterwards than went to actually see the Mona Lisa. They went to see where the Mona Lisa used to be more than they went to actually see the painting beforehand. Go figure. We're weird. People are weird. But anyway, slide nine. A healthy time, part seven. Uh, health problems, childhood obesity. Here we go. Many six to 11 year olds eat too much, exercise too little and become overweight or obese as a result. Um, it's interesting. If, if you look at different cultures will have more or less tendency towards this. Okay. And I'm not talking about different cultures like in America, American kids, there is a stronger tendency percentage wise to lean toward overweight and obese because of our, our, our tendencies here. But if you look worldwide, um, Certain cultures are going to be more or less likely to uh, to have this issue with kids. Okay. Kids naturally are more slim because generally they're more active. Okay, early childhood you're very active, and there's there's a very low chance of obesity in that age. Again, unless the diet and 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 family culture might change that, but the, the tendency is toward being coming very skinny. In this middle childhood, the tendency typically. Uh, if a kid just kind of does what they naturally should do, or they're eating, you know, decent food and things like that as offered to them, rather than like lots of sugary things and stuff, um, they will remain slim, right? Might have a little baby fat, but generally speaking, you're going to be pretty slim. Um, it's unusual to have a big kid if they are active uh, and and eating well. Okay. 18% of U.S. six to 11 year olds were obese. Um, I believe back in 2015 when they did this study. Uh, excessive, that's a lot, right? Almost one out of five kids struggles with obesity. Um, excessive weight contributes to future health risk increase, average achievement decrease, self-esteem failures, and loneliness. If you look at 
So activity basically increases your overall performance, right, in every way. Your, your, your physical performance is improved, your, your mental performance is improved, your organs and everything are developing easier because of the ex, extra blood flow and things like that. Um, so if you are struggling with being overweight, uh, you are more likely to become more sedentary because it is more challenging to move your weight around. Um, they've actually recently done a study, and this guy is, this doctor is pushing this for people wanting to lose weight. Uh, as you lose weight, you, you put on a, a, like a weight vest that has the same amount of weight that you lost. So like, let's say like you're, let's say you're 100 and, I don't know, 150 pounds. Okay. You're 170 pounds and you want to be 150 pounds. Um, when you lose like five pounds, you put on a five pound weight vest. When you lose 10 pounds, you add 10 pounds. When you add, you know, so on and so forth. So your body, your metabolism actually remains higher while you're doing your movement. But it also teaches you that you don't want to have that extra weight, right? If you're a 300 pound adult, you're, you're, you're basically carrying, it'd be the equivalent of me putting on a 80 pound backpack and moving around with it, right? The wear and tear on your knees and on your joints can, can be excessive. Same thing as a kid. The heavier you are, the harder it is to move your body because it takes more energy. Um, and because of that increased, uh, increased energy, right? Uh, I'm more likely to become more sedentary, the heavier I get. Um, with that sedentariness, you have increased health risks, right? It's harder on the organs. Your blood flow isn't as much. And so you're going to have some issues there. You have chances like diabetes forming and things like that. Um, average achievement decreases because of the lack of blood flow. So, so both physically and mentally, you're not going to be performing as well as you could if you were, you know, at a healthier stage. Um, with that, because you aren't performing as well as you could, self-esteem typically begins to decline, right? There's a, there's a strong correlation and generally causation of when you become over, overweight or obese, um, you start to feel negatively about yourself uh, because you, 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 you can't do the things that your friends can do and things like that. With that, there is a tendency to basically isolate yourself more and more, which can increase chances of loneliness. Okay. Um, so yeah. I'm just looking to see. Uh, interestingly, the, traditionally China and and India um, didn't have issues with this. Their 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 historical diet is very much vegetable based. Um, there is some animal products, uh, but it's usually kind of healthier things like yogurts and things like that. Um, so vegetables and rice would be kind of the primary go-to. As as they gained wealth and they they've started to move into more Western ways of eating. Um, and not the good Western ways of eating. Like when I'm, it's not like just roll or increasing meat in count or, or intake or something like that. Um, they're increasing like McDonald's intake and things like that. Um, and with that, they've, they've seen a significant spike in child obesity in both India and China in the last decade. Um, so yeah, this isn't just an American problem. It's becoming a worldwide problem. You're going to find that there's a strong tendency for this swing um, as a, as a country kind of increases its, its overall economic status, there's a tendency towards the kids of that new generation of that upper income, uh, becoming heavier kind of goes hand in hand, right? You might, you, if you have parents that were raised in a place where food maybe was scarce and you didn't know where you're going to get it. And all of a sudden food becomes abundant. Those parents are going to be more likely to encourage overeating, uh, compared to, uh, other, other families who maybe that's been the norm more often. Okay, slide 10, a healthy time, part eight, uh, health problems, childhood obesity. So recent dramatic increases found in developing nations as, oops, I forgot about that. As food becomes more plentiful, parents no longer worry that their children might starve, right? Um, childhood overweight correlates with asthma, high blood pressure, elevated cholesterol, and loneliness. As weight builds, school achievement decreases, self-esteem falls, and loneliness rises. Okay, so I've already kind of covered all those. We'll go ahead and keep rolling. Um, slide 11, health healthy time part nine, health problems, childhood obesity, genetic influences. So there's dozens of genes that affect weight by influencing activity level, hunger, food preference, food, our body type and metabolism. So for example, I am six foot 10. I don't know if you can tell in the video, relatively thin, right? I'm coming up on 40 and I'm still pretty thin. Um, when, when I was in college, it drove me nuts and in high school because I was trying to gain weight and I couldn't. Right. I was like on the, the seafood diet. I, if I saw it, I ate it kind of a thing. Um, I would sit down and eat an entire large pizza by myself with no problems or more. 
like inside of breadsticks and everything else. And I still couldn't gain weight. And I was like, what the heck? Um, I went in and started working with a, with a guy in the gym and he, just, he, he basically did some tests and I had a metabolism that's just off the charts. When I was in middle school, I had a 1% body fat. It actually caused me some health issues. I had the, the opposite problem basically and I couldn't gain weight. I, I went to a heart doctor because they thought I had a heart issue. And it turned out that I didn't have a heart issue. I was just too skinny. Um, and so I couldn't, I couldn't hardly retain enough water. And so I was getting, I was struggling with dehydration and issues. Um, so the, the, the heart doctor was like, I'm going to tell you this. He goes, and I tell like maybe one in a thousand. He's like, you need to eat things like potato chips that have more salt and you need to eat things that have more fat, as much fat as you possibly can. Um, and I did, I took that to heart and I did my best and I still couldn't gain weight hardly. I have an exceptionally strong or fast metabolism. Um, I also have a natural tendency for my food preferences to be on the quote unquote healthier side of things, right? I, I, I tend to not enjoy junk foods. Um, even when I was a kid, I didn't like candy and things like that. I'd go to Halloween cause I liked trick or treating and I'd have a bag of candy and I'd have that candy until the following Halloween. Um, just didn't like it. Right. Uh, hunger. I can, I can go all day and not realize I'm hungry. And then when I sit down and eat, I'm like, Oh yeah, I am hungry and I eat. Right. All of those things. Also, if I do eat a lot, my, my body becomes more, more fidgety, right? I'm ADHD. So I, I have, I have a tendency to be fidgety anyway. Um, uh, unless I'm talking, in which case I can kind of control a little bit more, but, uh, if I've eaten a bunch, I, I'll get twitchy, right? I'll, my, I'm, I'm constantly fidgeting with my leg is bouncing and all that kind of stuff. Um, those are all genetic tendencies. Okay. Um, uh, and, and it runs my family. Like my, my, my grandfather was fought in World War II at the time he was 28 years old, uh, six foot six and he weighed 148 pounds, right? Skinny runs in my family. I, I'm, I make him look he makes me look fat, like as far as what we, what, when I was younger or when he was younger, but, um, but yeah. So all of that, right. To say, in my case, I, I have the opposite struggle of some people, right. And my body wants to go faster. I have a friend on the other hand, who he is 300 ish pounds. He goes up sometimes and he goes down a little bit sometimes. Um, he watches what he eats constantly. Uh, he exercises like, I mean, the man, he, he does judo and jujitsu with me all the time and things. And he's just, I mean, he's active, super, super active. Honestly, one of the healthiest person people I know, um, as far as his ability to move and all that, his heart rate's excellent and the things, but he just cannot get the weight off. His metabolism is slower, even with all the extra work and stuff that he does. Um, his, his body type, he's just a big man, right? Um, he looks like the strong men competitors if you ever watch those guys like you know 400 pound men that can lift 1200 pounds and things like that um so that's a you know different different body types i can never do that my body which won't let me do that i would have to work ridiculously hard to make that happen um on the other hand he could never be skinny like me so that you know different different body types genetic late backgrounds um social context is also crucial right we we very much in our childhood pick up uh what is it going to be expected food wise things like that um, so if you're surrounded by a bunch of couch potatoes who eat potato chips all the time, things like that, uh, you are what you eat, right? So it, it, there's a tendency that we pick that up. On the other hand, if you come from a family who is like, they're all like health nuts and they're eating granola, I don't know, I'm trying to think of health foods, um, chicken breasts and broccoli or something like that, right? Um, and that's all they eat and they're exercising every day. And that's like, there's what their driving force is. There's a decent chance that you'll pick up that also. Okay. Um, so it's both social and genetic combined to basically give give you the, the pros or cons of how your life goes uh, body type wise. Okay. Parenting practices are linked to obesity. So infants, no breastfeeding increases the likelihood of a child becoming obese later. Okay. Um, not a guarantee, right? Just like breastfeeding isn't a guarantee that the kid won't be, won't be obese, but there is a, there is a tendency towards, um, towards becoming obese later. Also, eating solid foods before four months old increases the likelihood of obesity later on. Especially, like, if you have a baby, don't give them soda, right? Like, don't give them a Coke or something like that. Um, it's not good for them. It's not good for anybody, but it's really not good for them. Um, even if they like it. Like, don't train them to, to go for that, okay? Uh, preschoolers, if they have a TV in their bedroom, they shouldn't, right? Like, they shouldn't have screen time at all. But if there's a TV in the bedroom and if they drink soda regularly... Those two things are, are linked to uh, increased likelihood of, of struggling with obesity as child children. Um, school agers, if they get insufficient sleep, extensive screen time, and little active play. Okay. These are red flags, right? Extensive screen time, meaning like if you've got a 
five to 10 year old, maybe an hour a day or less. Okay. If you can, if you can get away with like no TV and no screen time whatsoever, other than what's absolutely required of them for school or something like that, like bonus points to you. Okay. Like screen time should be reduced as much as possible and then they should be moving, right? Get up and move. Again, it, it could be anything from just, you know, taking a walk down the road to, to climbing trees, to jump rope or something, right? Do stuff. Okay. And encourage it. If you're the parent, do it with them, right? This is another one of those times where it's not a do as I say, do as I, you know, or, do, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Do it with them. Show them that it's important. Um, if you're, if you have a tendency to be a couch potato, that's fine. Go against it. Get up and start moving. The more you move, the more you're going to want to move. Um, and believe me, I know that that's a struggle, right? It's, it's not an easy thing to necessarily do. Um, but it's worth it in the long run. Okay. Slide 12. Ads on obesity. So nations differ in children's exposure to televised ads for unhealthy foods. There's actually a lot of nations that outlaw, full-on outlaw um, advertising food and or advertising food that is aimed at kids. Um, the amount of this advertising continues to correlate with childhood obesity. They found this in 2014. Parents can reduce overweight by limiting screen time and playing outside with their children. Again, don't just be like, get outside. Go out and play, right? Do it with them. Play Frisbee. Play catch. I don't know. Do something. Um, community matters as well. When neighborhoods have no safe places to play, rates of obesity soar. Inner city uh, kids, there's a much stronger tendency towards overweight and obesity because there's just there's nowhere to get out, right? You're stuck in an apartment or you're on the street, and that's just not a safe place to be generally. And so... They have to, they end up spending more time inside doing inside stuff. You know, even if they're not doing screens, it's more likely to be like doing like board games and things, which are awesome and fun, but it's not going to, it's not going to give you that activity that you need. Okay. 13 differences in prevalence of obesity. Um, you can see the same slide on page 239, if you want to see this image. Um, but it just basically shows that the difference between boys and girls and of the different uh, ethnic backgrounds. So non-Hispanic whites, about 15%, boys are more likely to be obese uh, with, with, if you have a white background, than girls are. Okay, and it's pretty darn close to the same though. Um, Non-Hispanic Asian are the most likely to, or the least likely to be obese, the most likely to be in the, the standard to thin side of things. Um, Non-Hispanic black, the young girls are more likely to be obese than the boys, but both categories are more likely to be obese than the uh, non-Hispanic white or non-Hispanic Asian. Uh, Hispanics, the, the Hispanic girls are slightly less likely to be obese than the non-Hispanic black girls. Um, but the boys in this category are actually the most likely out of, out of all of the groups to struggle with obesity. There's different theories on why this could be um, and everything from genetic tendencies, right? Like there's the, 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 the body types that typically come from these groups. Um, to the, the diet choices, right? Um, where the, where the where the majority of these people are are living, right? So, for example, there's a there's a large percentage of the African or non-Hispanic Black population that lives in the Southern United States. Um, I have family that lives in the Southern United States, in Arkansas and Tennessee and Louisiana. If you ever go back there, the food is phenomenal. It's also an insane amount of calories. If I lived back there, I could probably get fat. Like, honestly, it's, um, you know, deep fried everything and barbecue and, and, and lots of good, like, bread and, you know, sweet corn and all that stuff. Um, and it, it's exceptionally fattening. Plus, you add on to that an environment that is exceptionally hot, okay, and humid. Um, I, I made the mistake of visiting my, my, my relatives in Arkansas and Louisiana in the middle of summer, it was end of July. There was a day it hit 100 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was 104% humidity. I didn't even know that was possible, right? I, I grew up in Colorado. 100, 100 plus humidity and it's not raining does not make sense to me. Um, and my aunt comes in and to me and my cousins, and she's like, "Why don't you boys go out and play football?" And I was like, "Are you kidding? Like, I don't even want to move." Um, that tendency, right? It, the environment itself makes it more challenging to get up and move. There's a reason why there's that stereotype of the, the lazy southerner that sits on the front porch and is just like, oh, it's hot. Um, that's really what you feel like doing. Like, I just wanted to live in front of the air conditioner, basically, when I was there. Um, so where where is the, where are they concentrated? And what does the environment look like? And what are the foods that are going to be the standard foods there, right? 
Um, and that will have an effect on some of these numbers. Plus, again, genetic background and, and family tendencies and like do you live in inner city or rural and all those kinds of factors okay um all right 14 health problems so slide 14 health problems asthma um asthma the definition of asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways that makes breathing difficult that's the official <laughs> description of it um Incidence of this has actually been on the increase, unfortunately. There's more and more kids that struggle with it. Now, it used to be, too, that asthma was something that a lot of kids would struggle with. It, it typically was connected to their, their their body was growing faster than their lungs. Um, and so, therefore, it, the lungs were put in under more strain, which caused inflammation, which caused asthma. Um, today, there, there's, there's more and more kids who struggle with it. And there's more and more kids who continue to struggle with it basically throughout life. Um, some of the signs and symptoms are going to be difficulty in breathing, right? Um, uh, basically, you, the, or the, the feeling that you can't breathe, even if you can, okay? But as the airways begin to basically get, as they inf get inflamed, they, they, they begin to swell. Um, and with that swelling, it closes down the airways. In extreme cases, it can, it can actually require hospitalization um, and or it potentially could be deadly, okay? But the, the, the struggle with breathing where you're just like, or you're like gasping for air that <gasps> it, it's actually a sign of asthma. There can also be things like sport induced asthma where if act, or activity based or induced asthma, where when you start to push your body, um, you start to have that feeling, right? Those can be some of the issues. Um, but why do we have an increase today? One of the, one of the arguments actually is the hygiene hypothesis and, and it's the opposite of what most people think. Uh, it's that we are too hygienic today. We don't get dirty enough. Okay. We live in a relatively sterile environment. We're using hand sanitizer all the time and soap and all these things, killing all these different things. We got air purifiers in the buildings that clean out all the dust. We don't have pets hardly anymore. If you do, it might be like a durable or something, right? Uh, all of those things combined basically make us more susceptible to allergies. Okay. Our body, our immune system reads then things that it's not used to as a attack, therefore it causes inflammation. Um, and so potentially the, the increase in asthma, especially like in inner cities and the like, might be connected to the increase in hygiene um, practices, specifically in our environment. Um, another possibility, again, there's actually, a, there's a significant increase of it in, uh, in inner cities and the like, is the increased pollution in the airs in those areas, uh, cause irritation, to air pathways, uh, which then in turn causes increased chances of asthma. Okay. So today, approximately 15% uh, of US parents with kids age five to 11 uh, report that their kids are diagnosed with asthma at some time. And almost 11% of them will still suffer from it uh, after that age group, Okay, which is a pretty big, pretty big deal. It's tripled. The, the asthma rates have tripled since 1980. That's a pretty big deal. Okay, so it's something worth kind of exploring and figuring out what can we do to maybe reduce this. Um, one of the strange enough, again, one of the answers is get dirty more often. Like let the kids play in the dirt, um, get them around animals more regularly. Um, all those kinds of factors have been shown to actually reduce inflammation. In fact, getting dirty, even as adults, uh, has been found. And by getting dirty, I don't just mean like nastiness, right? But like working in the soil and the dirt has been found to reduce inflammation in, in everyone at every age, um, including people that, that suffer with like chronic uh, arthritis and things like that, or chronic pain issues that are connected to as or to, to inflammation. Um, getting dirty regularly, getting outside and getting in the dirt uh, has been found to reduce that inflammation and reduce the negative effects of it. Okay. So go get dirty. Go run around and get dirty. Um, <clears throat> slide 15. Piaget. Cognition part one. We're looking at Piaget. Um, this is one of the guys uh, that, that, again, one of the kind of the, the, the giants within the field of, of development. Um, Piaget, middle childhood, concrete operational thought. So Piaget's term for the ability to reason logically about direct experiences and perceptions. There's actually a video. If you look in D2L, um, go down to the video sections. You can find a video called Piaget's Concrete Um, It's just a little like two minute clip or so, um, but it'll show kids in this age group demonstrating this, this concrete operational thought, okay? 
So littler kids, remember we looked at the examples in the book where it showed like if I if I took a cookie and I broke it in two, then they, and then I you know I gave one kid two full cookies and one kid two halves of cookies, they'd be like it's fine because it's the same. This age they realize that that's not actually that doesn't work, okay anymore. Um, that would be an example of it. If I took a thing of Play-Doh and I squashed it, they would see it as it, it hasn't changed amount. It's changed shape, but the amount hasn't changed. Um, whereas a four or five year old is, is like, if I took two things of Play-Doh and I squashed one down, and I asked him, is this, are they the same? And I did it right there in front of them. They'd say, no, this one has more that's not squashed. Okay. Um, uh, that doesn't, again, that they're, they're able to see it for what it is now. Um, classification, the logical principle that things can be organized into groups or categories or classes according to some characteristic they have in common. We started doing this naturally when we were kids, with smaller kids. Okay. At this point, we are we are more actively looking for those categories, those ways to, to, to give class to different things, um, including ourselves. We continue to do this more and more with ourselves, um, which is why suddenly things like brands and, and the like become... Uh, more and more important to this age group. Okay, you don't want to be the kid that does that stands out that doesn't fit in a given category, right? Um, seriation is things that can be arranged in a series. So seriation is crucial for understanding the number sequence and logical series. These are things that become more natural in the thinking processes of this age group compared to other ages, the younger ages. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's move. I got some notes here to make sure I got everything. Flippability. Uh, so yeah. Okay. Slide 16. Before we do that, though, let me give you the second random fact. Um, second random fact. Somebody, one of the one of the programmers, hid an episode of South Park inside Tiger Woods '99. Um, it was it was an Easter egg, basically. That you, you, know, you did something, and you could you could track it down and find it in there. Um, when they discovered this, though, EA, EA Sports, uh, their gaming side of things, had to do a massive recall on the entire game because it was copyright infringement and all kinds of different issues. But, um, so yeah, Tiger Woods 99 had uh, an episode. Uh, if you have one of the original games, you had an episode of South Park somewhere hidden in the game that you could find. Okay, back to the, back to the regular stuff. Slide 16, inside the brain, coordination and capacity. So Piaget recognized that connections allow logical ideas to be applied to many specifics. Um, so, um, we, we, we basically start to take all of this information that we've gathered and we begin to apply it to specific incidents. It's not just uh, this kind of abstract information, right? And it's not that we have to have a direct experience with this thing in order to figure it out. We can now apply different things that we've experienced that were similar into this, uh, this new incident. So today, brain scans can demonstrate maturation and classification proposed by Piaget. So Piaget, again, died in 1980. Um, he was born in 1890-something. But he, all of his observations are basically from, from just watching kids. He didn't have any tools to actually see how the brain was working. Today, they basically backed up what he was already predicting. Um, they found that hubs, especially near corpus callosum, damage uh, and brain dysfunction. So what they found is, uh, in this stage, the, 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 the brain begins to form uh, neuron hubs, which are basically, it'd be the equivalent of like a city. If, if, if people were neurons, uh, a, a hub would be the equivalent of a city. Um, you find more of them around the area of the corpus callosum, that the area in the center of the brain, right, that separates the two sides, the left and right side of the brain, um, with that really big nerve that runs between the two, you're going to find more of these hubs kind of clustered around that big nerve in order to speed up the communication from left side and right side of the brain. Um, it's also the area where there, where there is a chance for like every impact to the head, that's the area that, that gets the, the biggest negative effects from those impacts. Um, which can cause the brain to basically dysfunction. It, it causes it to, to not work how it should, or at least not work as well as it could, assuming you didn't have that damage. Uh, there's links between hypothalamus and amygdala, stress and early maltreatment. Um, they found that, that, that kids who basically struggle with, or are in a high stress environment as a kid, as a small child, and into this middle childhood, 
and or if they are treated badly, right, either abused or neglected um, severely. Uh, it basically increases the, the, these, these emotional response areas, but not their emotional control. So their emotions will become bigger, reactive, more reactive, but they're not going to have as much control over how they are used, how they produce themselves. Okay. Um, neurological pathways from general to particular and back again with maturation. So basically, our brains initially go with just, you know, blah, it's everywhere. Early childhood, we, we begin to have these very particular pathways. Now we're beginning to see more interconnection between all the different parts of the brain. So now the part of the brain that's connected to memory and these things are now kind of more inter intertangled with other parts of the brain, um, where it, it, it's becoming less specialized, which makes it more efficient overall. You still have areas of the brain that are very specialized, but they're more interconnected with other areas, okay? Which allows it, then that's gonna be just part of the maturation process. By the time you reach 25, give or take, um, it, your, your brain is pretty well inter integrated within itself. Uh, which allows for this ability to use particular specialized areas, but in conjunction more deeply with the other parts of the brain. And that's, that begins here. Slide 17, Cognition Part 2, Vygotsky and Culture. So education occurs everywhere, and knowledge is acquired from social context. Remember good old Vygotsky. He's, he's looking at our, the, the role of, of our society and our teachings and things like that and how they affect us uh, in, in developing who we are. So instruction is essential, he felt like, in this stage um, in, in order to really, truly thrive as an individual. Guiding each child using scaffolding through the zone of proximal development is crucial in this stage specifically. Okay, Early childhood, remember, we looked at this. The zone of, of, of uh, proximal development is that point where, where you can no longer do the thing by yourself without help or without guidance. The scaffolding is all of the things that we put into place that get you higher and higher and higher in your abilities. Um, so language, again, is going to be a key factor here, according to Vygotsky, uh, as far as allowing us to truly engage and, uh, and teach the children to do what it is that they need to do, how we can kind of push them along. Okay. Um, and so this is why edu like school in a traditional sense is a good thing, but also just like the hands-on schooling that you might get from, from family or from, you know, different experiences and things like that. Um, the more diverse your experiences can be, the better in this stage. It's actually in every stage, at least up and through uh, when our brain is done developing. 18, Cognition Part 3, Vygotsky. Play with peers, <clears throat> screen time, dinner with families, neighborhood play. Every experience from birth on teaches a child. Right. So the kind of school you go to and how they, how they approach it, how do they teach it, uh, what does your family see as important? Do you eat uh, dinner around the dinner table, like the dinner table in the kitchen, or are you, in, you know, watching TV while you eat? Um, do you have friends? Do you have a lot of friends? Do they all like the same things you do, or is it a diverse group of friends? Do you have different friends that like different things? All of these things are going to affect how, how we basically uh, work and interact. Okay. Every interaction teaches us something, essentially. Okay. It's also going to, we're, we're going to be picking up by watching and observing too. So like in this example, we have uh, a picture of these two little girls. Uh, on page 244, you can find the same picture. But uh, Vygotsky would argue that, that, you know, you have two little girls that are working with computers and technology and things like that. 50 years ago, that wouldn't be the case, right? 50, 60 years ago. You would, it was expected that boys would do that kind of things and girls, I mean, we don't have, we didn't have computers back then, but still. Boys would do that kind of stuff and girls wouldn't. Girls were more interested in like home ec and things like that. Um, maybe literature or things like that. Um, and so with, with that realization that that's not the case, that right, the culture has, has reshaped uh, our experiences and our understanding of how the world works, which has allowed and opened up the doors and pathways uh, for these new experiences of, of different groups of people. Okay. 19, Cognition Part 4, Information Processing Perspective. Uh, compares human thinking processes by analogy to computer analysis of data, looking at sensory input connections, stored memories, and output, just like they, we've seen before in the last chapters, right? Um, select relevant units of information. So basically, this is your, your brain takes in new data through your senses, boom, comes in, we perceive it, but how we perceive it is basically by connecting it to all of the data that we already have stored away, 
So if I show you a pin, okay, the fact that you know what this is, besides the fact that I just said it's a pin, um, is because it, your brain, and the fact that you know that the word pin represents this thing, um, is because your brain is able to pull all of those things, combine it into what you have just heard and or just seen, and uh, then put it forward as this is a pin, and a blue pin specifically, assuming you're not colorblind. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So we can analyze and connect. We can we can do this with things so that we can actually make accurate predictions of things that we have no experience with because we have had experience with other things that align fairly well with the given thing, right? If you play video games, you, you learn this pretty quickly, right? Once you learn the patterns of a, of a given kind of video game, um, you can apply the things that you've learned before to new games. So if you play first person shooters, uh, you get a new first-person shooter, you'll be a lot better at that game than somebody who's never played video games at all or never played first-person shooter games at all, right? Um, RPGs and all those kind of things also, same kind of stuff. You kind of, your thinking already has the, the basic structures of how these work and therefore you can apply it to it. Same with board games, same with sports and things like that, right? The more you have activity with it, like I, I farm, right? I have experience with lots of different animals. I get If I get a new animal, I generally can pick up how to work with them pretty quick because I can draw from my knowledge of all the other animals I've ever worked with. Um, we can express conclusions in understanding ways. So I can I can make logical, you know, linear or linear kind of arguments and come to the to the explanation. So so things like real logic are now more doable compared to previously. Okay. Abstract thinking still isn't there yet. That, that emerges more in adolescence, but uh, our ability to, to, to take, you know, one plus one equals two kind of thinking is becomes much faster in this stage, okay, and much more complex. Um, so it supports the notion that brain connections and pathways are forged from repeated experiences in day-to-day -day learning. It's our day-to-day -day experiences <clears throat> that basically shape who we are in, in this stage and later. Okay. Next slide, slide 20, cognition part five. Children's cognition in math. So children do not suddenly grasp the logic of the number system according to Piaget, right? Math knowledge accrues gradually according to Siegler. And some early math achievements, i.e. counting, do not correlate with later math achievements, information processing theory, and things like that, okay? Um, so math isn't something that just is like, well, we just do it automatically, right? Um, there are societies that they have found that are, are relatively, uh, for lack of a better word, primitive, okay? Like living tribal style where they don't count above 12 because there's no need to, right? Anything above 12 is just a bunch. It's a lot, like kind of a thing. Um, if you actually read historical documents, you got to keep that in mind. Some cultures are more or less likely to just be like, if it's above this, it's a it's this, right? Um, in China and India, for example, if you ever see 10,000, that, that means there was a lot. That, that, there, that doesn't necessarily mean they actually counted 10,000, but it, meant, it, it, it was so vast, right? It was this huge number. Uh, and so keep that in mind if you read historical documents what was their ability with numbers and how did they use them um, but all of these it's, it's something that's learned right we have to we have to build upon these and it's 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 a process and in that process though it becomes more and more natural for us to the point where today as an adult you're you're likely you likely can't even imagine being like like of course a number like two would follow one and three would follow two and you know so on and so forth the fact that you 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 just know that is because of these this learning process, okay, and that two plus two equals four and all that kind of stuff. Okay, slide twenty one, uh, information processing in the brain, part one. This image you actually uh, you can find this on page two forty six. Its extensive knowledge base makes it easier to master new related and related information. Okay, um, so factors influencing knowledge base are going to be your own experiences. So the more experiences you can have, again, the better. Um, current opportunity and personal motivation. This is and this is why they have this picture here. This little kid, this little, uh, this is Mo Mo Morris. He actually still is going. He's in, he's like eighteen or nineteen now. Um, Mo started a tie company when he was a kid. He liked ties. He thought they were cool. He started making them. Um, his mom helped him out with with the whole process. He initially started with uh, trading rocks for these ties, basically, when he was when he was uh, a young kid. By the age of, uh, let's see, by the age of 14, he started a company called Moe's Bows. 
By the age of 14, he had already sold $300,000 worth of ties. Okay. Experience. He liked ties. He had personal motivation to make ties and, to, and then to start to trade and, and or sell them. Current opportunity, his mom was willing to help him in this process initially until he finally got it figured out on his own. Um, this, this is an example of this. And he's, he has a very successful tie and like menswear um, company today. He also makes like pocket handkerchiefs and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> control processes, emotional regulation are coming on more and more online, right? The fact that I am at this age, you are more and more able to put aside like pleasure for a given goal, right? I want to get faster. And so I'm going to work my way to until I get better. Even if I don't enjoy the work necessarily, I want that goal, right? I'm motivated for that goal. And because of that, I, I am willing to put in the hard work to make that happen. I'm able to suppress my emotional responses in order to do that versus a four or five year old who's just like, that's boring. I don't want to do that, right? Um, that can be the challenges of that age. This age, that is less likely to happen. It still happens, right? Even as adults, you're just, sometimes you're just like, oh, I just don't want to do this. It's boring. But uh, you do it anyway, right? And the fact that you do it anyway is that emotional regulation. Selective attention is, again, that ability to focus in and, and, and set aside other things in order to do and achieve the goals that you have set for yourself. Okay. Slide 22, information processing in the brain, part two, control processes, executive processes. Okay, and so involve neurological mechanisms that combine memory processing speed and knowledge base. Knowledge base and memory, to some extent, kind of go along together, right? But the more experiences you've had, the more things you've had to basically put away in that. And uh, the more diverse those are, the more, the more creative you can get in your ability to, to basically take on new challenges. Okay. The processing speed is also important. If I throw a problem at you, like what is 33 times 51, okay, um, it's not just experience that allows you to potentially answer that question, assuming you have any kind of math things, right? Um, it's also the, the fact that your brain has matured a little bit where you can now process that information more quickly and come to the correct answer eventually. 33 times 51, right? I'm not going to try that because I am not a math person, but I'm going to, you know, I use that for an example. Anyway, um, requires brain to organize, prioritize, and direct mental operations. So this is going to be part of the process. It's, it's, it's becoming more well in tune with itself, and it's figuring out what it can draw from at what point for what thing. Okay, so it develops spontaneously with prefrontal cortex maturation, but it still is influenced by maturation and experience, right? Prefrontal cortex is, is maturing, getting more integrated, which allows you to take more control. This is the part of the brain, again, that gives you the, that, you know, you can make long-term plans with it. Um, you can you can think about a thing and think about what the possible outcomes could be and is it worth it. All of those kinds of judgments are, are from the prefrontal cortex. Um, experience, though, the more experiences you can have, basically gives that prefrontal cortex more tools to make a more accurate prediction of the potential outcome. Okay. Um, it's part of the reason why a 15 year old is not going to be able to make as, as good of a prediction of something compared to like a 30 year old or a 50 year old. Okay. Less experience, therefore less tools to work with in making their predictions. 23, information processing in the brain, part three, cognitive control. So you have metacognition and metamemory. Um, I'm gonna pull these up, so I want, I want you to find these. They are here somewhere. Are they not? I thought they were in the book. Hmm. Anyway, we'll keep rolling. Uh, metacognition and metamemory basically is it, the meta. I mean, anytime you see that, it means it's the greater, right? So metadata, somebody who works with metadata, they, they, they take the data from lots of different studies and they compile it to fi figure out kind of what is the overall thing. Metacognition is this ability to basically combine and connect the greater pictures within your head, the greater use of the brain, um, in order to basically pull together a greater, uh, a faster and more efficient way of thinking. Meta memory, similar kind of thing, right? Your memory becomes more more responsive um, to to present moments as you move through this middle childhood stage. Um, executive function is the ability to use executive processes. Um, 
So the, the uh, yeah, well, I think I've talked about that already, right? Prefrontal cortex, the brain is actually be able to make, you're able to look at things and come up with predictions of it more easily and are more accurate uh, compared to, to previous times in life. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, 24, cognition part six, language. Uh, every aspect of language, vocabulary, comprehension, communication skills, and code switching advance each year within, uh, from age 6 to 11, right? Uh, we get better and better and better at, at mastering language, essentially. Uh, code switching is really especially interesting because you can watch a group of kids from 6 to 11 um, playing together, and they will act differently with their friends than they do with the greater group. They will act differently with kids in general than they will with adults. They will act differently with their parents compared to other adults or strangers. You know, like, and they can change how they talk, the choices of words, the, the inflections that they give. All of those things are going to shift depending on the audience. That is code switching. Okay. Um, we, we get better at it in this stage, basically. So it becomes more obvious. Vocabulary is the understanding of prefixes, suffixes, compound words, phrases, and metaphors just continues to build, right? We start to learn the complexity of language more and more um, and, and how to use it more effectively. Uh, the more we are exposed to good language, right, the, the larger the vocabulary that we can build in this stage and the, the more, the more uh, complex and and uh, unique ways of using words in this stage uh, can have a massive impact upon your ability to basically communicate and and learn uh, information in the future. Okay. The greater your vocabulary, the greater your opportunities to learn more accurately will be. Okay. Increase your vocabulary. Read. That's one of the best ways. That's actually one of the best things you can do for kids in this age is read to them and or have them read, and read books that are a little bit more challenging, right? Not just fun, wimpy books, um, but read books that are a little above where they're at. So if you have a six-year-old, you know, read them I don't know, The Hobbit or, or um, I don't know, Anna Green Gables or, you know, like some, of the, some of the older good books that use a little bit more complex vocabulary. Um, be prepared to answer questions if you're reading to them, right? Like, as, if they're like, what does that word mean? You might be like stumped and have to look it up, but um, but do it right. Uh, the Phantom Tollbooth is a really fun book. If you got like a six or seven year old, that that's a great book to read with your kids. Um, it's a it's a fun one. But anyway, uh, look for books that kind of that kind of push them language wise. You know, you're looking for books and and literature that has some words that they don't know, or a way of phrasing things that doesn't quite make sense. Right? Charles Dickens is a great one. Uh, as an adult and as kids, read Charles Dickens. He 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 is a master with language, but he also uses a lot of phrases and things that we're not used to today. Um, but it will expand your ability to to think um, and stretch your mind a little bit more. Okay. Slide twenty five. Get off my soapbox there. Slide twenty five. Cognition part seven. Language context adjustment. So pragmatics. The ability to use words and devices to communicate in various contexts. Right. You, especially when you get closer to the end of this stage, right? A 10-year-old, 10, 10 give or take, will change how they speak pretty drastically um, if they're talking to a like a four-year-old or a five-year-old, right? Compared to their friends, compared to adults. And this isn't just the code switching. They're changing it up because they're uh, attempting to communicate more effectively with that group. So it's not just like I'm trying to impress this group or that group, but I'm trying to communicate at a deeper level with this group. Uh, and this is that pragmatics, okay. So it allows children to change formal, informal, and linguistic codes to fit the given audience, and basically the paint the persona that they want to give. So depending on what they're doing, it allows them to engage more deeply with a given group of people, um, given this the situation and all that. So again, so it's switching to some extent, but it, it it really is a matter of choosing what will work for the given crowd. Okay. Crowd meaning at least one other person. 26, Cognition, Part 8, Bilingual Education, um, a strategy in which school subjects are taught in both the learner's original language and the second or majority language, ELLs, or English Language Learners, uh, ESLs, or English as a Second Language, and then Immersion are going to be some different styles. 
Uh, ELLs are, are, are children in the U.S. Where, where, uh, whose proficiency with English is low, right? Um, there's usually some kind of a test that they'll take that kind of shows where they, where they land on a certain scale. And there's a certain point where if you fall below this point, uh, you, you end up with an ELL or an English language learner. Um, <clears throat> many children who, who speak a, a non-English -ling language at home, but then speak English ling in, in the school system, uh, are, 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 are going to possibly be ELLs, possibly. Okay, um, or an ESL, right? ESL being that that and, and it, it's it's different theories are basically approaching for kids who who they haven't they have they have no fluency with English yet. Okay, um, but at the same time, ELLs you could you could be a kid that speaks like Spanish at home. Okay, and then you speak English in the school, but you don't fall into the ELL because you're 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 proficient enough with English that you don't need it. Okay, um, and yeah. So that's that's kind of the, the idea or the thinking there. They're going to be looking at uh, where do you land, okay? Um, immersion is an is an option or a tool that can be used in trying to help kids learn language. It's basically where you. And I, I took a class like this in Spanish in college, and I just bombed the heck out of it. But uh, it was terrible. But any for myself. Um, but it's basically where you're, you're you're dropped into the the environment, and all you speak is that language, okay. Um, I did better when I actually went to foreign countries and had to, I was like forced to try to try to speak in those languages versus it just in the classroom. It just wasn't enough. If they're doing immersion completely, uh, I it was terrible. I ended up having to, that was one of the few classes I had to withdraw from in college. I was just like, I can't do this. I am failing. Um, me and like two thirds of the classes that I'm dropping. But uh, so yeah, immersion is it's it is useful, and in all reality, it actually is the best way to learn a language. Um, but it needs to be like a, a, a long period where you're immersed in that language and forced to speak with it. Okay, it can be very stressful. It can be very frustrating initially, but you'll pick it up faster with that, um, especially if your teacher is good. You know, if, if you have a solid teacher who, who can really pull you through it, um, it's, it's one of the best ways that you can learn a second language. Okay. 27, bilingual education. Uh, more children in the United States are now bilingual, and more of them speak English well, from about 40% of the bilingual children in 1980 to 82% in 2011. So the number, the overall numbers of kids who are bilingual has increased significantly. Okay, um, And the, the number of kids that speak English comfortably as well as their home language, um, and they speak of both well, has increased even more compared to the kids that speak a different language at home and English in the school system, but struggle with English. Uh, that it's, it, we've had a positive increase in that way. Okay. Okay. Interestingly, about one school-aged kid out of four in America um, speaks a different language besides English at home. So that's something to kind of keep in mind too. When you're, if you're working with kiddos in, in, in any way, shape, or form, whether that be education, whether that be you know, medical or whatever, uh, keep that in mind that one out of four kids in America on average speaks a different language besides English at home and So that can be something to keep in mind. Um, they might be more comfortable Utilizing a different language besides English or as well as English Okay Slide 28 cognition part 9 poverty in language um, SES affects cognitive development so poor and slower language mastery. They found that if, if, if you're from a lower economic bracket um you're going to struggle with language a little bit more typically. Not always. It's not a guarantee, um, but it's likely. So basically, the, the poverty doesn't seem to actually be a cause per se, but it seems to be an environment where there are multiple other causes that basically affect the reduced effectiveness of language. Okay. Um, so there's poor and slower language mastery typically. Uh, smaller vocabularies and impaired grammar than those from higher socioeconomic families. And school learning is slowed down in every subject because of these things. And it's tied to a couple different things. Um, they have found that so the socioeconomic effects brain development, um, hippocampus development impacted, and there's less language heard early in life, which are big factors there. They have found that it because economic level is oftentimes tied to education, if you're on the lower economic bracket, you're generally not as well educated. 
at least the adults in your life aren't. Okay. With the lowered education levels, you actually have a lowered number of words you hear, like as far as the, the kinds of words you hear are generally lower. There's less, you're less likely to have books in the house. So you're less likely to have access to, to reading materials. Um, but also just the number of words spoken per day are significantly lower typically in a lower economic home than in a home that's higher in economics. Um, so you, you might hear like lots of no's or yes or just quick phrases, um, but you typically the number of words heard per day is less than 10,000 in a lower economic home. Upper economics, you're looking at 20 plus thousand words per day, and it's more complex phrasing. Um, and because of that, you're exposed to more language, which means that you're, you grasp the tools of language more easily um, in this stage. And then you're, it, you, it allows you to thrive at every stage beyond this, right? Vocabulary oftentimes is very much directly connected to overall success in school. The greater your vocabulary, the greater your success. Okay. So again, one of the best things you can do, if you've got kids or you're working with kids, give them a, like work on their vocabulary as much as you possibly can. It'll give them a massive uh, head, like head start basically in their education. 29, <laughs> teaching and learning, hidden curriculum. Okay, unofficial, unstated, or implicit patterns within a school that influence what children learn, not formally prescribed, but instructive to the children. So this is the stuff that, like, you know, the, maybe the, all the, they're doing all the same thing that all the other schools are doing, but they're having a lot more success, or they're struggling a lot more than other schools are. And these are the things that you go and you go, why? Okay. Um, so some examples would be like physical surroundings, right? If, you, if, you, if you're in a school that this is like, you know, it's 50 years out of date, it hasn't had a fresh coat of paint for 30 years, and it just looks like garbage, right? You're like, you go in there, and you're just like, oh, I just don't want to be here. It feels like I might as well be in a prison, okay? Um, versus you go to a school that's like beautiful, right? And there's like beautiful green thing. Like we, we talked about with the early childhood, right? Like the, the Waldorf schools and things like that, where you walk in and you're like, oh my gosh, like as an adult, I'm like, I just want to sit in this room and like soak it in. It's beautiful. Okay. That environment is much more appealing to everyone compared to like a nasty, dirty, old beat up school. Okay. So what does the surroundings look like? You know, do you, are you inner city? You look out the window and you just, you see cars, buses driving by and it, you know, exhaust everywhere and things like that or are you like is it a beautiful park that you're in the middle of like all those different factors right can, can affect those things um teacher ethnicity do you have teachers that look at least somewhat like you right do they come from relatively similar backgrounds as you uh those things can can improve the likelihood of you learning from them because you basically have a connection to them more easily teacher expectations are are they high they should be okay Basically, what they found is that if, if, the, if the teachers have very high expectations and they try to hold you to those higher expectations, it pulls the kids up to them. If I aim low, it's kind of like one of those, you know, shoot for the stars because if you miss, you at least hit the moon uh, versus if you, you know, miss the moon and you, you end up in the gutter kind of thing. Um, that's, that's basically what they're looking at. Teachers who have high expectations and hold them there, it, it pulls people up to meet that need, right? Even the kids are at the lowest. They get pulled up higher than they would have if the teacher was shooting down lower. Okay. It makes me worried when I see like, like the old, the old, like, you know, no child left behind and all these things. It, it didn't allow teachers to hold high expectations because basically even if you bombed, who cares? You know, you, you still get shuffled on through. Uh, there needed to be some standards that can lift it higher. Psychologically, it's a benefit. Okay. Uh, other thing are going to be like course offerings, right? Yeah, you have the same standard courses, but do, like, do you have APA classes, right? Like, do you have, um, or what are they? Anyway, you have classes that are, you know, a, a higher level, college level. Do you have opportunities to be in high school and be in college at the same time? Uh, do you have, uh, like, different extracurricular activities? Music, is theater offered? Is, uh, do you have art classes? All of the dance, all the different things that possibly could be there. Like, like are there sports available to you, right? Um, that can all be connected. Schedules and tracking. Like, are they are they helping you really form a schedule that really fits with you? Teachers' characteristics. Do you have good teachers, right? Do you have a teacher that's excited and pumped to be there, or do you got like a teacher who's like smoking a cigarette and, and like outside their classroom going, you know, I just got three more years and I can retire, you know, kind of a thing. Um, that, that's going to have a big difference on impact on, on how they how you learn from them. Uh, get away from these stupid kids kind of a thing. 
Discipline and I don't know why. I can picture like an old old guy or old lady like ah, I just hate everybody. Okay. Uh, discipline and teaching methods, right? Are they are they working their best to try to get the best for the kids? Um, are they do they have a, a effective discipline tools um, where they can manage the classroom well? Uh, again, sports competition, extracurricular activities, uh, student government is that available? Physical setting, all of these things are going to in fact in, in, uh, impact the, your overall performance in a given school. And these are all, to some extent, these are all unmeasurable, right? Um, it, 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 it's, these are the things that are actually more important oftentimes than the, than the physical curriculum that you're learning. But these are the things that we can't really, you can't really put like a, you know, like this is what it is. Um, so it, it's really a matter of, did you get lucky to some extent? And, or did the people who, were they intentional uh, to make this as, as good as possible in, when, in developing this system? Okay, 30, learning in school, international testing. So international achievement test scores or trends in math and science studies, TIMSS, progress of, uh, in, in international reading literacy studies, PEARLS, uh, all of these, you, you can find these in the book too. Let's see. On page 251, you can find all of these things. Um, I think it's 251. I take that back. On page 253, 251, they give you some of the averages of what to expect um, about what time you'd, you'd be learning and, and knowing certain things. Um, on 253, you're going to find a, a list of these things and kind of where our scores are. What you're going to find, unfortunately, is that America tends to, to actually fall pretty low on these scales. Um, we just don't do good at them. Uh, a lot of times these are, these are nicknamed kind of like the, the, the nation's report card and those kinds of things, right? Um, we don't score well compared to other countries. Which, the, the countries that typically do score well, there, there are places like Singapore and Hong Kong score high almost always. Um, Finland also almost always scores high in pretty much every category. Um, why? Okay. And why aren't we... Why aren't we looking at these countries and looking at what they are doing and how effective it is, uh, and then trying to trying to replicate that to some extent here, right? If our system isn't working as good as it should be, why are we not improving it? Um, and that's a question that I still don't know. We have all of this research; we know what works. Why don't we do it? Um, for example, like in Finland, uh, up and through the early grades. Uh, they don't hardly, they don't spend very much time at school. They only spend a couple hours a day at school and they have almost no homework. But the school that they're doing is active and they're engaged in it. And it basically gives them more experience-based learning. Um, and as they move through, the, the, the amount of school increases slightly, but they still, they spend maybe half the time in the classroom that we spend. Um, and yet they still outperform us significantly. Why, right? There's studies that show why, but we don't copy them. Don't ask me why. That one, I don't know. We need to look at how we can change things to make things better. It'd be amazing. I would love it if we could say, like, United States scores in the top five every single time in every single subject. Um, but we fall so far short of that, it's ridiculous. Okay. Um, yeah. Slide 31. I'm just going to, you can read the chapter or that chunk of the chapter there um, on, on the details of those. Um, lifelong learning, shown here are PISA scores for 15-year-olds. In Finland is among the highest scoring nations. The United States is middling, just slightly below the overall average. 30 nations are below the United States and 30 nations are higher. For comparison, this graph also shows the highest scoring Singapore and lowest scoring Dominican Republic nations. Um, so yeah, where, uh, let's see, what's the graph there? Which one? One second. It's the wrong graph, I think. Anyway, sorry. Um, but this graph is actually showing is, is basically uh, how many kids in the United States go to public school versus private or parochial schools versus homeschooling. Um, what you'll notice, kind of interesting, there's an interesting swing to some extent is um, kids being homeschooled. This is pre-COVID, right? Like today with COVID, we all of a sudden there's a bunch of kids that are kind of sort of being homeschooled. Um, they're doing school at home, which is a different thing. But the, 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 there has been a favorable tendency in homeschooling in the United States. Um, 
And that can be a good thing. Okay. Um, homeschooling is one of those things that it can either be an amazing experience for the kids and it can really give them the ultimate ex experience and, and, and environment and everything for learning, or it can be terrible depending on how the parents handle it. Um, it, it requires a lot of the parents, right? But if you do it well, it really is the ideal environment for learning um, and the potential for, for greater understanding is, is at its highest. But it also can lend itself to being a terrible experience uh, if, if the parents aren't as, aren't willing to involve get involved as, as they should. Okay. Thirty two, teaching and learning part one. International schooling has marked national, ethnic, and economic differences. So creating equally valid questions for everyone is impossible. This is one of the reasons why um, these international tests can be very difficult, right? Um, even like IQ tests and, and and different things like in the United States, uh, not IQ tests with the there's one that we did nationwide. But they have questions like about the Armada, right? Most people in Colorado don't know what the heck an Armada is. The Armada is a, it's a Navy uh, term, the Spanish Armada, right? It was a giant Spanish Navy. If you grow up on the coast, you are much more likely to experience the word Armada than if you grew up in the center of the country. Um, so even just within our own country, it's difficult to find phrasing that works universally, right? Let alone if I'm using other other countries that use different languages and so I'm trying to figure out how to translate these words into, into terms that they would know and understand. Um, very difficult, okay, if not impossible. Uh, cultures differ in what they value, right? Again, Navy doesn't really matter to us in, here in Colorado, right? We don't have any ocean nearby. Um, therefore, it doesn't really, it just doesn't stick it to us as much, whereas maybe terms like cowboy, mountain man type stuff might be more useful. Um, and so because of that, we, we put higher or greater emphasis on certain things versus others. Uh, so you might be exceptionally intelligent in this area, but if they don't ask questions that deal with those areas, it falls, you know, you miss it. Educational practices differ within and across cultures, and variation is greater in hidden, hidden curriculum. Um, again, those are those things that are more difficult to measure. So. So yeah, even though they have thousands of people working on these things, honestly, the, the tests are difficult to really like. It, it gives us a, a it gives us a starting point, okay. Um, but in all honesty, it, it it's limited in what they can actually do for us. Okay. Interesting. Also, I was just thinking with Finland, um, thinking about like comparing countries and stuff. Finland's one of the few countries that also doesn't give a rip about the tests. They take the tests because they just they they participate in it because they for the knowledge side of things. Um, but if, even if they bombed on it, they're like, we don't really care how we compare, we're looking at what is the greatest experience for the kids in order to have the best citizens eventually down the road. Um, and they happen to be just doing amazing compared to most people. So, all right, teaching and learning part two, gender differences in school performance. So pearls, girls ahead of boys in reading in every nation they found. Every single nation that they've done this, that they did these testing in, uh, girls outperform boys in these cases. The Tims, gender difference among fourth grade math have narrowed or disappeared, and girls have higher report card grades, including math and science today. Okay. What accounts for this finding, and how do we know? I'm going to let you think about that for just a second, but it, this, it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Okay. I, I'd recommend pause the video for a second and think about this, and then come back, and we'll, 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 we'll discuss it more. So pause. Okay, and then we're back. Um, so here's some of the things that, that they found. One is the whole women's right movement. Right, um, which was a good thing. The, the 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 movement has been that we wanted to make sure, like you know, just because you're a girl doesn't mean you can't do math or that you can't you know do these things. You're not limited by your sex in these cases. Um, but <clears throat> this is this is where the issue has started to come. The pendulum has swung, okay, and just like pendulums do, we hit at one point we hit a center point where where basically it was even. We treated both sides evenly, but the the pendulum has actually begun to swing the other way, and boys are beginning to get left behind. Boys have been basically becoming ignored in the last couple of decades, um, and where the focus has been primarily on the girls and making sure that they're getting what they need, we've actually lost some for the guys. So swing good, right? For the girls' side of things, we, we, we needed a swing badly. Like girls need to be brought up to where they were, were reaching their full potential. But unfortunately, in doing that, it's, it's, it's gone the opposite way for the big boys. So the boys are now becoming left behind. It's just becoming a struggle. Um, 
in this case. So, and it's hard. I mean, it really is hard to be like, when you're trying to deal with helping everybody, right? Uh, there's a tendency to, to leave someone behind. It used to be the girls who were getting left behind, now it's the boys. And so we need to kind of re-examine these things and figure out what can we do to really help both sides, all children, um, to achieve their full potential. But anyway, okay. 34, that's, and that's one of the factors, right? There are other factors involved, but that's gonna be one of the big ones um, that they pinpointed in the research. They found that cultures where, where, where this movement has occurred, um, the, the girls are going to outdo the boys. And it's not necessarily because they actually are smarter, it's primarily because they, they, they're, they're focused on them, right? They're equally intelligent generally, but in this case, if, if we're teaching in a way that it reaches more girls than boys, the boys are gonna struggle more. Just like it used to be taught in a way that reached more boys than girls. Okay. Um, 34, teaching and learning part three, schooling in the US, so increases in international test scores. We have bumped up a little bit. Largest disparities between incomes and ethnic group test scores, not so good, right? Um, Basically, if you're from an upper class neighborhood and everything, you're gonna have a much higher test score in general than if you're from a lower uh, lower class neighborhood. Um, and we have a, like, so in Finland, I think it's like a 2% disparity between the highest level and the lowest level income wise in their, in their country. Um, we have like a 40 something percent disparity. Not good, okay. Uh, national standards, national assessment of educational progress or NAEP, an ongoing and nationally pr uh, representative measure of US children's achievement in reading, mathematics and other subjects over time. It's nicknamed the nation's report card. Um, disparities between national and state scores, Latino and African and European American fourth grade reading and math scores, high school graduation rates, all these things. Okay. Um, so what are the causes of these disparities? It tends to be all of that hidden curriculum. Okay. We, we need teachers that look like us to some extent, right? Interestingly enough, this is actually another theory of why boys are struggling more than girls today, is the majority of the teachers are female. That hidden curriculum aspect is becoming a big issue. Okay. Um, also, I think our teachers need to get paid more to have a higher quality of teachers overall. But, but the, like in Finland, that's another reason they uh, teachers are paid the equivalent of what doctors and, and lawyers and the like get paid um, in Finland. It requires a master's degree just to teach at pretty much any level in that country. Uh, so it's the best of the best. You got to, to take a test in order to even get into the program. The best of the best become the teachers, and they get paid well because of that. Um, we don't do that so much, right? But anyway, that's that's some of the different shifts. But that's part of this also. We, we, there's a tendency of like, it's becoming more diverse in the in the teacher side of things. But there is a tendency for the for the white, you know, European descent uh, people to be the teachers. Um, so with that, the, that hidden curriculum becomes an issue, right? Plus, if you're from an upper class family in a nice neighborhood, uh, the the school gets more funding because there's a higher tax bracket. And so they have all these cool things. Their environment is beautiful. They have brand new technology, right? Versus kids in like inner city where it's, you know, super low income or super rural areas where there's very few people and it's super low income, low taxes. You know, maybe they're all farmers or something like that. Um, and you're in a school, it's like you have a textbook that's 11 years out of date, right? Um, I visited a school and their, their history books were, were 15 years out of date. Okay. They, it was this was back when Obama was the president and the last president that they had was was Clinton in his first term okay um, like that doesn't that's that's not okay but they didn't have enough funding to get the new books like the school was struggling just to stay afloat um, those are going to be those kinds of things that cause problems right you don't have the the, the, the benefit and the, and the and things of those of different groups all right random fact I almost forgot about to do in these. Uh, let's see, <clears throat> random fact number three. Somebody hid, oh, no, I already did that one, sorry. Batman and Predator are in the same fictional universe and have actually been together three times in comic books uh, since they've been created. <laughs> random weird fact, okay. Batman and Predator, um, who would have thought? I guess if you're really into comic books, you might have already known that, but anyway. Um, okay, slide 35. Teaching and learning part four. Issues within U.S. education today. So these are some different things that basically, it's a bunch of important questions. 
Um, should public schools be well supported by public funds? Should tuition vouchers be given for private schools? So if you don't if you don't want to go to public schools, should you be given some kind of a voucher that's equivalent to what the school would have gotten paid that you could then use for private schools? Um, should more charter schools open or should they close? Right? Uh, does homeschooling meet children's needs? If and if so, should there be things that maybe they get benefits to or no and all that kind of stuff? Should public schools be free of religion? Um, should it be taught as just part of the curriculum? Should you teach all of the religions or at least touch on them all? Like, should there be like a world religions class? All those kinds of questions, right? Should the arts be part of the curriculum? Should children learn a second language in primary school? Can computers advance education? Are there too many students in each class? Should teachers nurture soft skills as part of the curriculum? And honestly, I have an opinion on every single one of these that's, you know, due to research and everything. But who decides the answer to these questions? In America, at least. Okay. And who should decide? I think those are, those are two very different questions today, unfortunately. Who should be the ones that are making these choices? And who is it that actually is? Um, I'm going to leave it there. I want you to do some research and dig for that one. Okay. Um, but think about it. Like, who, who, what are the answers to these questions, in your opinion? Um, why? And then who is the one that's actually answering these questions in our, in our society? Um, and are they doing a good job with it? ask that too. Okay. 36. Children with Special Brains and Bodies, Part 1. Oh, quick, real quick too. The answer is actually the government is the one that does it, unfortunately, rather than the people. But anyway. Okay. Children with, spe <laughs> Children with Special Brains and Bodies, Part 1. Uh, developmental psycho, uh, psychopathology links usual with unusual development, especially when the unusual results in special needs. Uh, Interestingly, also, the special needs in this category are, we, we specifically focus on the special needs of people who, it, they have a struggle with things. Okay. We don't look at people who are exceptional, because they are also officially special needs. But anyway, four general principles. Abnormality is normal. Every single person on the planet is different from everybody else. Okay. How my brain is wired is different than everybody else's. Everyone else is probably happy about that one. Um, but there, I mean, there are some general categories where things should be and generally are, but the official pathways of my brain, given the fact that I have billions of, of neurons and trillions of pathways between them, um, differs substantially from every other living thing on the planet. Okay. Disability changes year by year. So if you have a disability, you, you recognize that it can be improved, it can deteriorate, it's not, it does not remain the same, right? ADHD, dyslexic. It has, it has, I have learned skills that work with them, um, and, and, and so therefore I've, I've overcome them, right? So that the, the impact on my life, it's still present, but not as severe as it used to be, because I've learned how to work with it. Um, life may get better or worse, so there's, there was a chance, depending on how they were handled it, I could have got much worse with these things. Um, and this is actually true for everybody, not even if you have a disability, right? Your life could get better or worse at any given time. Abnormality is completely normal. Just be, you know, you, you don't work the same way as everybody else does. Um, and the diagnosis and treatment reflect the social context. Uh, so ADHD, for example, when I was a kid, it was very rare to find somebody who was actually diagnosed with ADHD. Um, by the time I was like in middle school, it seems like everybody was diagnosed with ADHD because it was like the new popular thing to diagnose everyone with. And they try to put everyone on different pills and things to take care of it, right? Um, social context is going to be, that's going to be the case. Right. When I was younger, like I was kind of the first generation that was starting to actually get diagnosed with it. Before that, I would have just been like, well, he's just a hyperactive boy, right? Like that's just what he is. And that would, they would have been like, you know, frustrated and I've been in the principal's office all the time. But, um, but yeah, that, that kind of thing is going to be different. So the, the, oh, I don't have the book here. Uh, the DSM-5, here we go. Just like, Oh, here we go. Uh, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This is basically, if, if, if I'm trying to diagnose somebody, I would pull this book out and I'd be like, let's see, what are all your symptoms? And I would find it in here and I'd be like, you apparently show, you know, a mild case of, uh, I don't know, <coughs> whatever, dyslexia or ADHD or whatever. Okay. Um, this is the DSM-5, right? There have been five different versions of this book to this point, and they are currently working on number six because the DSM-5 kind of sucks. But uh, there's, 
there there has been some, there were some choices in there that weren't the greatest as far as actually useful. But um, this is the book that if, if in order for if I was working with people as a, like trying to diagnose them and try to help them figure out what they need to do to solve things, this would be the work that I would this would be the book that I would reuse. If you want to use this, this we have a couple copies of this in the PCC library that you can check out in the library. So I recommend taking a peek at it. But um, it's interesting, right? It's useful. It makes it depending on how what the terms are, it can make it more or less likely for people to be diagnosed with certain issues. Um, you know, so you might end up find it super easy, like like autism, for example. Um, it's it's relatively easy to get put on the spectrum with how the DSM five is put. Okay. Um, which may be a reason why there has been an increase in people who have been diagnosed with autism in the last 10 years or so. Okay. That kind of a thing is, is, what, is what this book potentially can do. And that's that social context, right? And, and then how we treat it is, is we, we hopefully are going to be using research to help you, help, help you figure out how to treat it properly. Um, but that's, that's something that they're going to be looking at. So special needs, we, we generally look at the, the, the part of where we're struggling with something, right? I'd actually recommend looking at, there's a video on here called, uh, by, it's, I have it on D2L in the video section for this week. It's Temple Grandin, The World Needs All Kinds of Mind. Temple Grandin is actually a woman who was diagnosed with autism. She's a professor at CSU Fort Collins. Um, it's an excellent talk. She's a really interesting person. If you, if, you, if you are on the spectrum or if you know someone who's on the spectrum, I highly recommend her works. Uh, but it's a very interesting talk where she's looking at the differences in how our brains can be wired and how that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just different. Right, um, it can lead to struggles in certain areas, but it can also be an advantage in others, and that's what she ended up finding for herself. She's an, she's a master of um, understanding uh, animal psychology, and she's actually innovated the whole like dairy and and beef industry and things with how she understands how working animals and things like that. Because of the fact that she's on the spectrum, it gave her a different perspective, which allowed her to do that. Okay, okay, thirty seven. Children with Special Brains and Bodies, Part 2, Measuring the Mind. So we have different testing, right, to kind of figure out where do you land compared to everyone else. I um, mean, aptitude tests that basically show, like, what is it that you're good at or not good at? Um, are, do you have the potential to master a certain set of skills given your natural tendencies and things like that um, in a certain body of knowledge, right? It could be, like, art. It could be music. It could be athletic ability. It could be, like, all these different things, right? That's your aptitude test, your tendency towards math and all that kind of stuff. Um, achievement tests, measure of, of a certain, what level of mastery have you already achieved or proficiency in, in a given thing? Usually it's going to be like math or science or reading or something like that. Um, but that's going to be like, where, where are you so far compared to everyone else? The idea of multiple intelligences. Um, we're going to look at this in a second. I have a video on here also with Howard Gardner on multiple intelligences. So again, check that out. Um, he, Howard Gardner was the one who basically came up with the idea back in the 90s, late 80s, early 90s, of, of there being a possibility of multiple ways of, of un, like un, multiple ways of being intelligent. Um, IQ tests um, is, is another one. So an IQ test, a 100, if you score a 100 on an IQ test, it means you are exactly average uh, in, in your ability to, 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 to work through, you know, different issues or different psychological things and stuff like that, not psychological, uh, logical things, not just psychological, logical things, okay. Um, and they're going to be looking at your mental age compared to your, your biological age. And typically what happens is you're going to actually peak somewhere around 20 to 25 is where you're going to hit your peak IQ numbers, and it'll be a slow decline after that point. But you, you still, you hit that mark um, at that point, okay. Um, if you ever get a chance to do an actual IQ test, they're fascinating. Not the little weird ones on that you find on social media and stuff, but like a legitimate IQ test. I took one. I, I had to do it for, for a school I was applying to. I didn't realize I was taking an IQ test, which might have been a good thing. Um, but yeah, it, basically they're, they're, it's a combination of they ask you like grammar and, and uh, not grammar. Sheesh. Words. Not working. Um, vocabulary. That's ironic. So that's one of the things that they actually uh, test you on is vocabulary, as well as your like spatial reasoning and things like that. Okay. Um, the Flynn effect is an interesting one. So somebody who scored, let's like, say, 120, 100 years ago, back when the IQ test was first being used, um, 
if you took their scores at that time and compared it to scores today, they would score lower than they did then. Because the population as a whole is getting more intelligent in the last hundred years, which might be surprising to some people. But we uh, overall, our ability to reason has improved as far as like mathematical reasoning and things like that has improved over the last century. Uh, and this is the Flynn effect. He was the one that realized that this was the case. Okay. Slide 38. Children with special brains and bodies, part three. Multiple intelligences, according to Gardner. Like I said, I have a video with him. Um, he initially came up with seven different forms of intelligence that he was able to identify. Um, he had linguistic, logical, math, logical slash mathematical. It's kind of the same thing. Uh, musical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, naturalistic, and existential. The, the naturalistic and existential or spiritual uh, were added on later. Initially, he, he ended with the intrapersonal. So linguistic would be somebody, if you, if you have, let's say like you're really high in linguistic intelligence, uh, you're going to have a mastery of words. Okay. Um, these would be the, like your, your best debaters and things like that will generally have a relatively high linguistic, uh, they'll score high on there, right? Uh, using, using arguments and, and expressing yourself well, poets and all those kinds of pe people oftentimes will, will, score high, will score high on the linguistic scale. Uh, logical mathematical is actually going to be the primary area where uh, the IQ test is looking at. And it is, it is what it sounds like. It is your ability to look at things logically, to structure them, and to, to be like, this is, you know, if A, then B, and then, you know, if, if, if this is that, and then that equals C, and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, very structured, very logical. Musical, it's a whole different way of understanding the world through music. So there are, like, top musicians are going to be, uh, score very high on this. You, you can identify, there's all kinds of ways you can identify it. One of them is actually if you use music in your day-to-day uh, things and not just like listening to it all the time, but you actually create it. Uh, there's a high chance that you are higher on the musical uh, intelligence level. Spatial. Albert Einstein actually had an exceptionally large portion of the brain that is has been tied to spatial learning and spatial reasoning. Um, but it's your ability to look at a thing like, okay, my dad has a very high amount of spatial reasoning. He was a, he was a, a, a carpenter for years. He can look at something and he just knows how it fits together and how it works. But an easy example of this would be like he can take a bunch of luggage and he can look at a tiny little trunk and he can figure out a way to make all that luggage fit in that tiny little trunk and there's like no room to spare. Okay, high spatial reasoning. Uh, bodily kinesthetic is the ability to get your body through space. Okay, top athletes are going to have high bodily kinesthetic uh, intelligence levels typically. Uh, interpersonal is your ability, if I, if I remember these two right, interpersonal is your ability to understand yourself. Um, so your emotions and everything that's going on inside yourself. Intrapersonal is your ability to understand others and 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 to connect with them and to understand what's what they're going through. Naturalistic is is they've actually dis distinguished the ability to understand nature um, and the, and all of the ecosystems and things like that. There are people who just naturally get that. Other people struggle with it. Okay. And then existential. This is going to be the little philosopher kids, and then, then they turn into philosopher parents or adults. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're the kids that ask the questions like, why? Like, what happens after we die? Okay, I, like, I have one son that seems to show, he shows relatively high existential uh, intelligence. But he's always asking questions like these deeper questions that make you kind of like stop and go, Oosh, I don't know, you know, like uh, questions about the existence of the universe and like, is there a God? And he's, he's already asking all these, like, why? And like, why do we think that? And all that, okay. Uh, and so each of these, these nine have basically been confirmed to some extent that there are, in fact, these different kinds of learning and different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of intelligence, given that fact. So in education, Gardner, he felt like schools often are too narrow, teaching only some aspects of intelligence and thus stunting children's learning. Usually, there's a high level of linguistic and logical mathematical. All the other ones are kind of shoved to the side, right? Um, in, in that case, if you if that isn't one of your intelligence areas naturally, and we all have levels of intelligence in all of these, but you're going to have some that you favor, right? Uh, and you're going to have some that you might struggle with a little bit more, just on your, like because of how your brain is wired or whatever. It's just a little bit more challenging, or it doesn't seem to matter to you, or different things like that. Uh, but if if I am teaching you and I'm trying to use like I'm like this is important, you know, logical mathematical is important, but that's not how your brain works. 
you're going to struggle more and you're going to look and feel inferior to those who that is more their natural style. So schools, cultures, and families dampen or expand particular intelligences, right? If you're from a family where bodily kinesthetic is the thing, right? Everyone is athletes and that's all that life is. And you are a musically intelligent individual or a existential individual. Um, you're going to struggle, right? Because it's not, it's not valued. That form of knowledge isn't valued in that family or in that setting. Um, same thing in our schools, right? Logical, mathematical, and linguistic is, is, is valued. If that's not your thing, though, you, you feel inferior to those that it is, that it is their thing. It's kind of like those comics where it shows like, you know, the final test is the first person to climb the tree is the, you know, that this is the, the test to see how intelligent you are. And you, you see like a fish, an elephant, a monkey, and a kangaroo or something. You're like, great. You know, like the monkey's going to be like super intelligent because that is what they are good at. Same kind of thing here. Okay. It's a tough one to, to really to figure out how to utilize, especially within the within our way of education system as it is today. Um, but it's it's worth knowing. And if you know if if you can figure out which one of these you are, and it, again, don't do the social media ones. They might be helpful to some extent, but like look for a real one if you actually really want to understand this. And or if you have kids and they're maybe struggling in some way, this might be something worth exploring. Um, because if you can pin it down, you can actually it can potentially help you with kind of understanding yourself and where you fit. Okay. Thirty-nine children with special brains and bodies, part four. I'm going to kind of wrap this up relatively quickly. Neuroscientists and psychologists agree on four generalities. Brain development depends on experiences. The more experiences you have, the better. Uh, it basically offers more opportunities. That you, we are we are experience craving animals up until a certain point. Usually, the older we get, we start to lose interest a little bit as we get, as our brain becomes more concrete and less less plastic. Um, it, it, we, we kind of lose some of that. But at the same time, we are driven to four experiences as kids and, in, and up through adolescence. Um, dendrites form and myelination changes throughout life and continue to do so forever, right? Until you die. Uh, we, are, we are creating new, myelination can grow or, or, or lapse depending on our experiences. The more experiences you have, the more you can push yourself to learn new things, the longer your brain will last in the long run. Uh, children with disorders often have unusual brain patterns, and training may change those patterns. So sometimes the brain wires differently. I can, if I put you in the right environment, I can potentially rewire your brain to make it more effective to help. If you are struggling with something, I can help you basically overcome that struggle. Uh, each brain functions in a particular way, which is that neurodiversity, right? Every single person on the planet has a different brain that works differently than everybody else on the planet. Same, we got the same tools-ish, but we use them differently, and because of that, we end up with all the amazing diversity that is the human race. Okay. Also, another thing is uh, because of that, brain scans and those and like tools like that actually aren't effective at diagnosing problems, right? There was a guy uh, a little back, while back. I read an article on him. It was I can't remember what magazine it was in, or journal. It might have been one of the psychology journals I was reading. But anyway, um, he got conked on the head, and because of this conk on the head, they they brought him in for an fMRI uh, to make sure or an MRI to make sure everything was going well. He seemed fine, but they were they were worried he's, he had a concussion and things like that. When they when they did the scan, they found that uh, about ninety percent of his brain was missing. So basically, his his the the inner portion of his brain was gone. All that was there was like fluid, and then the brain was all on the outside portion. And he functioned totally fine. He had a slightly above average IQ, um, and so there there was no signs that he had anything different than anybody else until they did this brain scan. They were like, my goodness, like, how are you alive, right? And so he's become this whole research thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are drastically different potentially with all the diversity that we have. Okay, slide 40, children with special brains and bodies, part five, special needs in middle childhood. So there's two basic principles in, of developmental uh, psychopathology, complicate diagnosis and treatment, uh, multifinality and equifinality. So multifinality, is that there's, there's one cause that has a lot of symptoms, or at least a couple of symptoms, okay? Uh, that uh, different manifestations basically of these things. So you have one thing that's causing it, but there's like lots of lots of things happening. Equifinality is basically the difference of that. You have one symptom, but a lot of causes. And because of that complexity of those two things, and you could potentially have some areas of your life that are multi-finality uh, and other ones that have equifinality and all these things, 
all happening at the same time, it makes it extremely difficult to pinpoint exactly what needs to be changed to help. Um, some suggest that childhood psychopathology was underdiagnosed in early DSM editions and overdiagnosed in the DSM-5, which again is why they're working on the DSM-6 now. They're trying to find a balance between those two. Um, 41, children with special brains and bodies, part six. Children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, there's potential problems in three areas, inattention, impulsiveness, and activity. Mine tends to be in the activity level uh, and to some extent the inattention. Uh, there's no biological marker. There's some suggestion of relationship with brain regulation and uh, often uh, comorbid. There's, there's, there's lots of, it's got lots of, of levels to it. The SM5 recognizes learning disorders, um, dyslexia, which I have a little bit of reading issues, uh, dyscalculia, which I have apparently no real issues with, and math, a little bit maybe. I, I flip-flop numbers sometimes. And then dysgraphia, which is penmanship, which to this day is brutal. I have a very strong case of dysgraphia. I, my, my, I, it is, my brain actually registers it as painful when I write, um, which is not fun. Okay. It made school, like they, they couldn't figure out why I would just, I, every time I'd have to write something, I would just burst into tears when I was a kid. And they couldn't figure out why until they tested me and that's what they figured out. So, um, so yeah, and it can affect different people in different ways, right? You could have dyslexia and it could be like you flip-flop words where it looks backwards to you. You could have it where your, your, your mind just kind of scrambles things. Um, you, I mean, there, there's, there's so many different struggles that, that each of these potentially can be, and it differs from individual to individual. Um, it's just the fact that you have an issue in that. Okay. 42, children with special brains and bodies, part seven. Uh, specific learning disorder, marked deficit in a particular area of learning that is not caused by an apparent physical disability or by an unusually stressful home environment. Okay. Um, so everything is going well. That's another thing too. If you're working with a kid and they're, and they're, they're showing these red flags that they might have a learning disability like dyslexia or something like that, um, it's, it can actually be manifesting from stress at home. So if they have, a, if they have an unhealthy home life, uh, they can, it can look like they have a learning disability when in fact what it is is that they're, they're struggling with dealing with too much stress, uh, in their life. Once that's been cleared and you're like, nope, their home seems perfectly fine then we start to explore uh, the, the potential of a learning disability. So dyslexia is an unusual difficulty with reading, thought to be the result of some neurological underdevelopment. I was not able to read until after the very end of third grade. Um, weirdly, once I figured it out, I, I suddenly started reading, like by fifth grade, I was reading like The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings and things on my own. Um, but before end of third grade, like I couldn't even read Dr. Seuss. It was brutal. Dyscalculia is an unusual difficulty with math, probably originating from a distinct part of the brain. Um, probably. We don't really know for sure. We have a picture here of a kiddo who he has dyslexia. Um, for certain kinds of dyslexia, there are certain things that you can do that can help him. In this case, he's got special glasses um, that are, are like prism glasses. And they actually help. His, his, his eyes had a tendency of jumping on the page. And with these glasses, it reduced that jumping, which allowed him to basically learn to read. Um, but that's a relatively rare form of dyslexia, and so it doesn't help everyone. Just because you have dyslexia doesn't mean that that's going to be the cure. Okay. There are some things you can do, like get colored sheets and stuff that go over your pages to change the background color, things like that. That can also potentially be helpful. But again, depending on the individual. Slide 43, children with special brains and bodies, part 8, autistic spectrum disorder, or ASD. Any of several disorders characterized by poor social understanding, impaired language, and unusual patterns of play. Uh, causes and treatment are disputed. We don't actually know why it's why it happens. Um, there's no apparent markers or anything like that that are obvious. Uh, equifinality applies for sure, right? It, it can be these symptoms, but there's multiple causes for it. Uh, most diagnosis at age four or later. So it starts to really show itself somewhere between three, four, five, six years old. Sometimes, uh, in fact, one young woman I worked with, she wasn't diagnosed until she was in her mid-20s. Um, as having, having, uh, being on the autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, gender and ethnic differences in rates, men are more likely to, to suffer from autism, but because of that, there's actually a little bit of a tendency to under diagnose, uh, girls. So boys are more likely to be diagnosed with it than girls because boys get it more often than girls, but because of that they don't look for it as much in girls. So three categories are got mild, moderate, and severe. Mild, I have a couple friends who are on the spectrum that are on the mild side of things. Um, 
and you 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 wouldn't know it necessarily. They're quirky, right? They have very little social understanding. One, strangely enough, is a is an actor, which it seems odd, but um, as far as social understanding and the like, the other is an engineer. Um, they've actually done a, a study, and they found that approximately I saw a couple different studies. One said that sixty seven percent, and one showed that seventy two percent, I think it was, of engineers actually can are can be diagnosed as on the spectrum. So, um, but they would be mild, right? It, it allows the brain to think differently than, than the average person. And so therefore it, it could be a, a, that. Moderate, it could be a struggle, right? You, there can be some, some, some issues there. Severe, it can actually shut you down when it's at the severe level in, in, in some cases. Um, and it, it can be, you know, there's, there's lots of different issues with it. Uh, typically it has connections with how your senses take information and different things like that. But, um, but yeah, check out again, if, if, if that's something, check out Temple Grandin. She can be really useful in kind of understanding all this. 44, Children with Special Brains and Bodies, Part 9, Special Education. So Labels, Laws, and Learning, 1975 Education of All Handicapped Children Act, uh, which was an inclusion class, general classroom or LRE. Appropriate aids and services were given to make sure that kids could succeed no matter what their, their issue was as much as possible. Other strategies were response to intervention or RTIs and individual education plans or IEPs, which is what we typically use at PCC if you have a handicap in some way, shape, or form. Um, the IEPs are what we strive to, to utilize. Before we go to the next slide, random fact number four, the last one. Amber colored rear turn signals reduce collisions by about 28% according to different statistical things that they put in. So if you use your blinkers, you are 28% less likely to get into an accident than if you don't. Please use your blinkers, right? They're there for a reason. Okay, 45. Children with special brains and bodies, part 10. This is the percent of three to 21 year olds, children with special educational needs compared to total public school enrollment. As you see, there has been a significant increase um, over the last several years. Um, is that because we are underdiagnosing or is that because we are overdiagnosing now? That's, a, that's up for debate. Um, but yeah, you can take a, take a peek at that. You can find that this thing on, where are you? Nope, not that one. Page 267, you can find that same graph. And the final graph, or final, not final graph, final, whatever it is, slide. Children with special brains and bodies, part 11, slide 46, gifted and talented. So high IQ, unusually talented and unusually creative children may require special education. Um, Interestingly enough though, we, we don't actually have anything in place to help these kids. Um, so needs of unusually gifted children not covered by the US federal laws, there's nothing saying that they have to do anything for you. Uh, each state selects and implements its own system. So it'll differ from pretty drastically from state to state. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy about which system to use because just like the, the, the um, special needs on the other side of the spectrum, right? have diverse differences in, in what the needs are. Same thing with this, right? You could be, you could be highly gifted in uh, music or art or theater or uh, argument or math or science or reading or writing or you know, there's just so many possibilities of where uh, you might need additional help to basically really fully uh, reach your potential. Um, in some cases, kids that are gifted and talented at exceptionally high levels, um, can appear to have special needs in the negative side of things in the school system because the school system is not teaching them to them in the ways that they need. Um, so sometimes that struggle can actually be a sign of intelligence or greater, greater giftedness. So anyway, we'll end there. That's that chapter in a relatively large nutshell. This would be like a coconut, not just like a walnut. Um, so yeah, don't forget to do the quizzes both for the, the lecture as well as for the chapter. Um, there's the two. If you have any questions, message me um, in D2L, and I will get back to you as soon as I possibly can. And beyond that, have a wonderful day. Uh, check with D2L as always, and make sure that there's no announcements or things like that. Um, otherwise, I will see you all in the next video when we're looking at chapter eight, uh, continuing with middle childhood, uh, but looking at the psychosocial side of things, so the, 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 the effects that our environment has upon us and our development. Um, I look forward to seeing you there. Have a good one.